Hi, my name is Weldon, and I'm an avid Bermudian scuba diver and underwater explorer. You see, <laughs> thank you. Wow. You see, the ocean is indeed vast and full of valuable resources, rich in resources, but it's also very fragile. And as divers, we have our eyes on the ocean all the time. I feel it is important that we not only work to better understand, explore, and protect the ocean, but we need to take action in order to see that for future generations, it is what we experience today or better. In 1968, Baba Diom is quoted as saying, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. But a bit of background in history before I really get into the talk. You see, Bermuda is made up of many islands, about 140 of them. And the larger islands are connected by bridges and a causeway totaling around 21 square miles of land. We're best known for our pink sand beaches, our Bermuda shorts, golf, and we happen to be the shipwreck capital of the Atlantic. But did you know that Bermuda has 200 square miles of reef? So, in essence, Bermuda's not as small as we think it is. Because as soon as you put that mask on, you're opened up to a whole new world to explore. So Bermuda's not all that small. You see, that's me. <laughs> You know, um, growing up, I was not exposed to scuba diving. In fact, uh, I spent most of my time you know, on the beach, playing in parks, um, a little bit of snorkeling. And I've learned since this talk was to happen that I had friends that did scuba dive, but they never introduced me to it. I didn't have any family or friends that really said, hey, Weldon, let's go scuba diving. So I did what most typical kids do. You know, we play and we do what we're taught, right? So it was actually a twist of fate back in 2006. I, uh, I was at a point in my life where I decided to leave Bermuda and work and live overseas. And scuba diving was actually a bucket list item. I simply had to try it. It's one of those things that friends were asking me, well, how's the diving and how's your boat? And how's your horse? And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't have any of that stuff, and I've never dived. <laughs> so I decided to scuba dive and try it out. Now, any one of us in this room, experienced divers or not, can sign up for a Discover, Discover Scuba Diving outing, where you just call one of the local dive operators and book an outing, and you spend a little bit of time with an instructor, and you put on the kit, and you dive. The instructor is never more than an arm's length away from you. Now, I remember jumping off the back of the boat and letting out the air of my buoyancy compensator jacket and putting my knees down into some hard sand. And I remember scooping up those pink rocks. And those pink rocks actually become the Bermuda pink sand that decorates our beaches. I remember poking with a little pudding wife fish, and they're a very popular fish that like to interact with divers because our fins silt up the sand and they like to find critters that have been hiding. And I felt free. I was weightless and looking around. And I wasn't alone. I had other divers in the water with me. It was beautiful. And it was in that moment that I decided I had to do more as a diver. I was a diver as of that day. <laughs> I was hooked. And so I immediately worked on certification. I worked on getting to know people, networking within the diving community, and just do more. So I fell in love with the ocean. Jacques Cousteau, pioneer of marine conservation and exploration, is quoted as saying, the sea once it casts its spell, holds one in its net of wonder forever. So I did leave Bermuda for a while, but I did come back. 
And when I came back, I got into diving heavy. I mean, my days were and still are broken up into thirds. It's sleep, usually, work, because I do have a career in IT, and diving. So I was either in, on, under the water, or doing something to do with the ocean. So I'd go to every event. I'd go to everything that was going on, because I wanted to be informed. I wanted to get involved. I wanted to make a difference. But what was happening is I recognized early on that not many locals were actually involved. I mean, we have a diving community, but I see the same faces at these events. And while there's nothing wrong with that, I was wondering why there weren't more. There are so many of us. Why aren't we all into the ocean? It is, in fact, our backyard. We need to all be looking into the ocean and experiencing more so that we can understand it and protect it. So I wanted to do a lot more. So I started an organization. And what I wanted to do with this organization is essentially create a grassroots, action-oriented organization that will connect the diving community, bring divers together, and raise, raise awareness, get more locals in the water, and keep divers diving, because I was meeting many locals that had the gear, but they were not diving. And I wanted to address that. And that's how Bermuda Ocean Explorers were started. And it's been three years, as of this past September, where we've done some amazing things in connecting the diving community. Now, there's a few events that people can do to connect the community, divers and non-divers alike. And collecting, picking up marine debris and hunting lionfish are two of the key things I'm going to speak on today, because there's many other things that we could do. But these are the, the two I'm going to focus on right now. So show of hands, how many of you have walked the beach and seen debris? Now, plastic pollution and the marine debris, it's, it wasn't a forever thing. I mean, there was a time where we could walk the beach and not see any trash. But guys, how many of you that saw debris actually picked it up? Yeah, you picked it up, disposed of it properly. Nice. Well, marine debris is a pervasive problem that we cannot afford to ignore. And it's, on, it's a global problem. It's not just a Bermuda problem. Every year, tens of thousands of animals and seabirds and fish get tangled up in debris and drown and die. Um, these animals digest the plastic and it gets into their system and it, it causes problems that we fully don't even recognize right now. We've got the gyres huge gyres of plastic pollution swirling in five different areas around the world. And these aren't mountains of debris. They sink, and this becomes a plastic soup. So what I've been doing over the past few years is bringing the community together to dive against debris, to tackle the plastic pollution problem. And it's been fun. I remember I said, you know, keeping, uh, making, picking up trash Fun? Well, my formula is making it a party. <laughs> so by making collecting trash a party, I've been able to bring volunteers from all local organizations together to have fun. We have scuba divers in the water with gloves and onion sacks. That's how you collect debris in the water. You don't use a bag, you use an onion sack, and you fill that up, and you send it to the surface to a guy on a kayak when it gets full. And we'd have people on land because you don't have to dive to make a difference, you know? You can come and fill up a bag and we separate tin, aluminum, and glass. That's what we recycle here. Everything else goes to the incinerator to be burned. But bringing people together has been key. Being the conduit has been a phenomenal success for me. I never knew that the organization itself would be this successful. I'm just, just a guy that's trying to make a difference and bring people together. And it's been fun. We've collected hundreds of pounds of debris. We've collected everything from scooters to chairs to you name it. We've pulled it out of the ocean. Because see, not all plastic pollution 
floats. A lot of it does, in fact, sink. And this is a photo of our most recent cleanup at Mangrove Bay. And again, a very successful cleanup. I think that plastic pollution is a huge problem. And it all starts with us, the consumers. We need to make better choices of how we consume and manage our waste. Now, can anybody tell me what this is? <laughs> so the awareness, we can check that box. We're all aware of what a lionfish is, and that's great. There are many organizations in Bermuda and around the world that are working hard to raise awareness about the lionfish. But did you guys know they're edible? How many of you have actually eaten lionfish? Have you tasted it? Uh, not that many of you have actually had lionfish. I think we're going to work on that today. Now, the lionfish is not a Bermuda problem like marine debris. It is a global problem to a degree. You see, in the Indo-Pacific, in the lionfish's native range, they've existed in harmony with their environment. Everything's good. Over here in the Atlantic, though, they were introduced through the, through the aquarium trade, and they've left the controlling mechanisms that they have over in the Indo-Pacific. So over here, there are many issues that make the lionfish a really bad problem. In fact, it's probably the, the biggest catastrophe the Atlantic has ever experienced, and I'll tell you why. This fish, though beautiful, is covered in 18 venomous spines. This fish, though beautiful, unfortunately, its prey, which isn't just little fish, but invertebrates too, they don't recognize this fish as a predator at all. In fact, prey go to the lionfish, so it's given a meal all the time. It just sits in the shadows, sits in the sand hole, and eats. They have no mechanism to tell them they're full, because in the native range, they just they eat, and they don't know when the next meal is going to come. So just genetically, they'll eat, and they don't have that stop reflex. Now, one of the most shocking things, guys, is that their reproductive rate is through the roof. A typical female lionfish will spawn two million eggs a year. So we need an army to keep their numbers in check. Eradication is impractical. Control and consumption is the only way. Now, in Bermuda, we have a lionfish control plan. And behind that control plan is a lionfish task force, which is made up of virtually all of the ocean-related organizations in Bermuda. And I happen to be a proud part of that. Now, we have the government involved. We have fisheries involved. We have a deep diving technical team that go deep to put their eyes on the deep ocean. And they'll pick lionfish off as they find them. But they're looking for hot spots. And we want to work with fisheries and government to put traps and pots in these hot spots. We have recreational divers and sport divers and technical divers and even free divers doing their best to comb and police the reef to keep their numbers down. Because if we don't, when we go snorkeling off Church Bay or when we explore Tobacco Bay, all we're going to find are lionfish. But they eat the fish that keep our beautiful coral reefs healthy as well. So they eat those fish. And then we have huge problems. It's called a trophic cascade. It's all connected, but we need more divers in the water to keep them at bay. Now, when I catch them with my friends, we will take them home, cut off the spines, and eat them. Consumption is key. So take them home, grill them up, and what makes what I do and what we do at Bermuda Ocean Explorers work is we just want to include everyone and share everything. So this is a photo taken from my kitchen where I just whipped up a lionfish fillet with some salad. The fish is a very light white meat and it's extremely tasty and comparable to hogfish and grouper. So don't worry about your grouper, your rockfish, it's, it's good. But we're trying to manage that as well, because those numbers are really, really low. This fish does not belong in Bermuda. 
and we have to keep their numbers in check. There's, there's a lionfish calling program in effect that if you're a resident here, you sign up for the class. Take the class, it's about an hour and a half, and you come out of that class with your lionfish permit, and you're able to grab a trident spear, just like what I have over here, and carefully spear them if you see them, whether you're scuba diving or free diving. So there's a lot to do. We need to protect our reef. You know, this is the very reef that is the healthiest reef in this part of the, in this part of the world. This is the very reef that protects us from storm surge. This is the very reef that contributes to our economy because people come to Bermuda to snorkel and dive and explore. And it's also the very reef that provides us with food. So without our reef, honestly, I don't want to imagine having barren reef covered in lionfish in our waters. It, it hurts me to even think about that. And that's why I'm so passionate in growing not only divers, but getting people of all walks involved. You don't have to get wet to help. Healthy Reef. What I'd like you to do is get in the water, experience the ocean, scuba dive, snorkel, paddleboard, swim, engage in the ocean, and who knows, you might get caught in its web as I did. If you see it, pick it up. I gotta say, once you actually see marine debris on the beach, and you, you identify it, and you pick it up, and you add it, put it in your bag, you are in a, you, you get put into a state where you can't then not see it, you know? So whether you're picking up bottle caps, or glow sticks, or, or discarded fishing line, just pick it up and dispose of it properly. It all makes a difference. But again, a lot of this starts at home. We need to work on how we manage our waste and how we dispose of it. And, and that's a global thing. We need to consume less. And finally, lionfish, eat them. <laughs> eat them, please. They taste great. So. Join us, and let's dive purposefully. Thank you.